What if you could see, imagine if you could see the outcome and decision before you made them. Would we decide differently what we do? And while we cannot go back to make um, different decisions, we can learn from the one um, decisions that have been made, right? The truest of teachers, history. We can learn from history. And this was in my devos, and I was so impactful. I was like, man, I was going to do a different message, but I thought, you know what? I want to share this right away because I felt that it was, it was just so, it was so impactful for me. Um, so at this point, Israel and Judah are split. They're no longer a one nation. Um, Israel left, so there's a ten and there's a two. So Judah and Israel are split at this point. Uh, the godly king, a godly king emerges, and the story of one, this is a story of one ill-advised decision that caused generations of pain and death. And we can learn from the, from the biblical story. And this is something I appreciate about the Bible is that it includes not only the good stories, but the bad stories, the foolish mistakes that people made. And today's verse, uh, or the, like, the title is called, It Felt Right, When Seemingly Small Decisions Turn Into Big Disasters. So the scripture for today is Proverbs 16.25, and it says this, that there is a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to destruction. And Matthew, I felt that a counter verse to that is Matthew 6.33 is that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that you need will be added unto you. So when we pray, Father, we come to you, we pray that your word would come alive to us, that it would be our teacher, that it would be our light unto our path and our light unto our feet, God. So we thank you. We pray, Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'll do something a little bit different. I'm not really going to have a lot of scripture on the screen today, but I was I didn't want people to get lost. So I just kind of did stick men or whatever. But are you going to see what I mean? So we're going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. And this man that I was talking about, this king, his name is Jehoshaphat. He's a godly king, and he's one of like the most, I don't know, in my opinion, like probably next to David, he's he's up there. Like he's a godly king. He's a godly man. He is he loves the Lord, and you can tell like in his life, but he made some decisions that kind of made me scratch my head. And I hope that we can learn from this guy's decision making that like, like a lot of you, I know you guys are godly people, and you can make decisions because, well, you know, quite frankly, it felt right. It feels right. And I want to show like this guy's life that he was a godly man, but yet he made some decisions that kind of like, like I said, hmm. So I'll just pick up 2 Corinthians chapter 18, verse 1. Like I said, it might be on the screen, it might not be. Um, I put a few verses on there that I thought was pertinent. But you might want to open up your Bibles or turn them on to follow, or you can just listen to me, that's fine. So 2 Chronicles 18, it says this, verse 1. Now Jehoshaphat had, a great, had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. So this is one thing, this is one point, okay? So having a son, he had his son. In some versions, it says his son... He had his son marry Ahab's daughter. Now, who is Ahab? Ahab is probably the wickedest king or one of the wickedest king over Israel. So he is an idol worshiping. If you recognize him, Ahab, his wife's name was anybody? Jezebel, right? I don't know if anybody said that. But anyway, Jezebel. Do you guys recognize Jezebel? She was the queen that had all the Baal worshipers. She was the one that was killing the prophets of God. She was slaughtering God's people. She even killed innocent people just to get their land. They were wicked. They're a wicked bunch. They're a wicked couple, power couple, but super wicked. So this is what Joseph had did. He, he had his son marry Ahab's daughter. It seems innocent enough, and it felt right. It's the normal thing that, you know, some strategy that, that kings did in those days was, hey, to have peace, I'm going to give my daughter to your son, and we're going to be family, right, kind of, in a way. So that's what happened. Verse Verse 3, it says this, Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go to war, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied, as I, as I am you and you are my people, as, sorry, and my people are your people, we will join you in war. We are, so basically, we're joined in marriage. We family, bro. You know what I mean? Ahab, we family. We're going to join our people as my people. They're brothers and sisters. Basically, they're from the tribe, the, the 12. Their ancestors are part of the 12 tribes, right? It's, it's intermixed. So he says, we're going to join with you. Uh, you know, it, it feels right. I mean, you guys are brothers and sisters, literally brothers and sisters. It feels right. So he says, why don't we do this? But um, verse 4, it says this, But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First, let us seek the counsel of the Lord. Ah, smart move, 
J-Ho, seek the Lord, okay? How many of you guys seek the Lord on stuff? When, when there's decisions to be made, you guys seek the Lord. That's a good thing, okay? So we're going to let the story move on. Verse 5, it says this. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets. So Jeho, or I'm going to call him Jeho because his name is so long, Jehoshaphat. But Jeho said, hey, let's seek the Lord. So what happened? So the king of Israel, Ahab, brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, shall we go to war against, against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I not? Go, they answered, for God will give you, go, for God will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there anyone, um, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord? I don't know what gave it away. Like I had some pictures that I thought, you know, my wife was like, no, don't use those pictures. But maybe they're kind of um, creepy looking. I don't know what it was. But right away, Jehoshaphat knew that this wasn't prophets. This wasn't the prophet of prophets of the Lord. So he says, you know, these prophets came. He asked, let's seek the Lord. Ahab has, hey, I got my crew. Jo, Jeho is like, oh, let's, isn't there somebody from, um, that, that is actually the Lord's prophet? So the king, Ahab, says this. He says, there's still one prophet, though whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. <laughs> because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah. He's Micaiah, son of Imlah. Jeho said, you shouldn't say such things. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, at once. So he did. They brought him. Um, they were sitting at the gate of Samaria, and the, prophets, um, the prophets, the 400 prophets, were prophesying before him. Now Zedekiah, so this, Zedekiah is one of the 400, okay? And Zedekiah, son of Kenaniah, made iron horns, and he declared, this is what the Lord says. With these, you will gore the Armenians. And he's like, you know, he's probably in my mind's eye. Okay? He's like, you're going to gore the Armenians. Like, just go get them. You know, he's like, so he's like doing that. He's prophesying this to the kings, to the two kings. And it says, all the other prophets, prophets, the 400 prophets, are prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said. For the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Okay? You guys follow me? You guys okay? Even though I don't have the scriptures. So, oh, I think I get stick men. Should I put the stick men up there? So, should I go to the first one? Okay, so we see King Joseph at, right? King of Judah. King Ahab, king of Israel. So, King Joseph at gave his son, Jehoram, or they got married, right? They gave their, their son and daughter to one another. Remember this, okay? Jehoram and Athaliah. Okay, go to the next slide. So, they're like, okay, so King Ahab, that's, they're talking. We're going to go to war. Okay, go to the next slide. I just wanted you to follow along. Okay, so the prophet of God, we have Micaiah, right? So the prophet of God says, and then this is what happens. The messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the other prophets, without exception, are, pra are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. Is this not censorship? <laughs> right? Censorship is in the Old Testament. So we see censorship to set the narrative. Hey, bro, Micaiah, this is what you need to say. They're putting words in his mouth, telling him to set the narrative. I mean, what are you going to do, bro? Are you going to cancel me? Is that what's going to happen? But in verse 13, Micaiah said, As surely as the Lord lives, and I love this about Micaiah because he's a man of God, he has no fear of what man can do to him. The 400 guys, they're prophesying something different. He's going to say what is on the Lord's heart. Micaiah said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what, my God says, verse 14, he says, when they arrived, the Ahab asked them, you know, should I go to war? Micaiah said, attack and be victorious. He answered, for the Lord will give them into your hands. <laughs> That's probably how he said it, okay? And then the king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So it's interesting because the king wants to know the truth. Micaiah went along with the, the narrative, go king, you're going to be successful. Bro, tell me the truth, right? Oh, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth, right? <laughs> you guys knew that was coming, right? You can't handle the truth is what he was basically saying to King Ahab. Verse 16, Micaiah answered. Remember now, Jeho also asked for the word of the Lord. He asked for a prophet of the Lord, and he's getting the prophet of the Lord. Okay, sometimes when we ask the Lord for an answer, we pray and we ask the Lord, but we need to heed the answer that the Lord is giving. I felt so strongly about this. When I was reading this, I was convicted in my heart 
Verse 16, it says this, Micaiah, this is the prophet of the Lord, right? We see Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord, answered, I saw all of Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. The Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. So he's warning them, guys, go home in peace. Don't do this. Don't go to war against Ramoth Gilead. Verse 17, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? So at this point, Jeho should have recognized the truth. It seems that both of these men, their ears were deaf to what the Lord was saying. God was warning them, but they were deaf. They chose to believe the majority. They chose to believe the majority. I want to say that again. Okay? Ahab treated the truth with contempt. So in the verses... Um, there's, like I said, I'm going through a lot of verses, so I'm going to summarize. God basically allowed a deceiving spirit to prevail over these men. Okay? They asked, for an, they asked for God's word. God gave them his word. They rejected it. They treated it with contempt. So what happened? God allowed a deceiving spirit to give them advice. This is what's happening. You can go back and read it if, um, if you want. It's a little bit more wordy. It's, or I, I have it right here, verse 22, it says, So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of, of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Verse 23, Then Zedekiah, son of Kenaniah, I think I have another slide, Zed, uh, maybe not, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. <laughs> he slapped Micaiah in the face. He slapped the man of God in the face. Which way did the Spirit of the Lord go when he went from me to you to speak? He asked. I felt like this guy, Zedekiah, is so arrogant that he would go up and he would slap Makai in the face. Okay? There are people, and I felt like this is what the Lord said, there are people that are so deceived, they literally, they literally believe that they're right even when they're dead wrong. They want to believe their own lies. So bad, they want to believe that it's true. So bad that they're convinced that their way is the truth. And it leads others in the way of destruction. 400 of these prophets are prophesying something other than what the man of God is prophesying. They want to believe it that badly. Jeho asked for a prophet of the Lord. There was one. His name was Micaiah. But he chose to listen to the majority. And it seems that the majority won out after, after the whole, after everything was done. We need to be careful when we follow the majority. Here's what I felt like the Lord said. We need to be careful when we follow the majority. Because many times in Scripture, if you read Scripture, if you follow Scripture, many times in Scripture, God speaks through the minority. God uses the remnant. There's a lot of times. But more often than not, God uses the minority. God uses the remnant. Okay? Not the majority. I'm just putting it out there. You, when you read Scripture... Um, you know, take note, be a student of Scripture, how God, how His character, how He speaks to and through people. He uses the minority, okay? God uses the remnant. Verse 24. I know that He would want to use the majority. Don't get me wrong. His heart is for all, that all should come to the saving knowledge. But unfortunately, you know, well, not unfortunately, but we have freedom of choice. And a lot of times, the majority is not what the Lord is saying. Verse 24, it says this, Micaiah replied, you will find out on the day that you hide in your inner room. So he's talking to Zedekiah. And he said, the king of Israel then ordered Micaiah, send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, this is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return. And maybe that's where the movie's got, you know, when you go to prison, you get what? Bread and water, right? It's probably where they got him. Just like how when policemen... Um, we know that they all of them eat donuts. No. <laughs> I look at Henry. We know that's not true, but Hollywood, right, would have us believe that that's what occurs, right? Bread and water, donuts, you know, is part of the, the whole made up Hollywood um, truth, right? So he says, Makai declared, if, if, you return, if you return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, Mark my words, all you people. Now, if you're Jeho, you just heard the man of God giving an opposing prophecy. 
are you really going to al align yourself with Ahab? So I put this here, right? It sounds okay, like, you know, 400 guys prophesying, the majority is prophesying positive. You ask for the man of God. The man of God gave you his word from the Lord, and then you disregard, okay? Now, Jeho, I want to I point out that Jeho is a man of God. He loves the Lord, and we're going to see he really loves the Lord, but I don't know what, what it was that he made this decision. It, it really puzzled me, okay? So one bad decision leads to another. Verse 28, it says, So the king of Israel and Josaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jeho, I'm not making this up, okay? Said to Jeho, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal royal robes, so Ahab disguised himself. So basically, um, should I go to the next one? The Showing the kings. Uh, oh no, sorry. I, I did it. You're, you're good where you were. Oh yeah, there you go. So basically, Ahab is like, I'm going to wear camouflage and um, go into battle, but you wear your kingly robe. In fact, wear the orange one, the one that says, the king on the back. And wear your big shiny helmet, the real big one with the peacock feathers. But I'm going to go incognito, okay? Hint, if two kings are going out to war, which one do you think the enemy is going to peg as the king? The guy in camel? Or the guy with the orange, I mean, he didn't have orange, okay? But the guy that clearly looks like the king, right? So we see this. If you're j -Ho, you're going to be like, bro, I'm going to be in camouflage just like you, my man. You know what I'm saying? But Joseph had like, okay. So that's what, he, that's what, I'm not making this up. Okay, so verse 30. This is the thing. Now the king of Aram said, he ordered his, his people, he says, Do not fight with anyone small or great except the king of Israel. So they're hunting for Ahab. Okay, When the chariot commanders saw Joseph at, they thought, this is the king of Israel. The bright orange robe, the king gave it away, right? That, like, gave it away. The shiny helmet, right? So they, they, they turned and attacked him. Joseph at cried out and the Lord helped him. God drew them away for the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel. I don't know what it was, but they discovered that that was not the king of Israel. I don't know, maybe the king of Israel was taller. Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Ahab looked like, maybe he had just had a certain look to him. Like, I don't know, maybe he had like, that just was him. Or maybe one of them had white hair, one black hair. I don't know, maybe one of them was bald, one of them had plenty hair. I'm not sure. Maybe there's a height difference. I'm not, I'm not certain. The Bible doesn't say that. But they recognize that that was not Ahab. So they stopped pursuing Jehoshaphat, even though he was wearing the bright orange with the king on the back, right? Verse 33, this is what happened. Prophecy coming through. Prophecy from the word of the Lord. It says, but someone drew a bow at random and hit the king of Israel. They shot an arrow. I don't know, maybe it was like misfire, like, oh, it, psh, oh. And then there it is, like misfire, and it struck the king of Israel between his armor and wounded him. All day long the battle raged, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot, facing the Armenians until evening. Then at sunset, he died. I hope they let Micaiah out of jail. You know what I'm saying? He's eating bread and water at that point. But this is, that's the first chapter. Whew. Okay, you guys okay? I'll keep, I'll keep on going, okay? Chapter 19, I'm going to break this up. I'm going to summarize. So Jeho, when he gets back from the war, so his, his, his compadre gets killed. Ahab gets killed in battle. Just like the Lord said, just like the man of God said, he gets killed. Verse 19, he comes back to Jerusalem. Jehu gets rebuked by the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. That was a Hawaiian prophet. <laughs> it's from all the way from Hawaii. He's like, I, bro, I came all the way from Hawaii. My father is Hanani. Bro, that was a bad decision. Okay, so he's like, why are you helping the wicked and those that hate the Lord? Good question. So he, rebu he rebukes Jeho. This alliance with the wicked king Jehab may have felt right. He might have even said, I don't know, it felt right. It could have been disastrous if not for the Lord's interve intervention. This is what I felt like the Lord highlighted. As, we, as his representatives, we need to evaluate our alliances. Okay, like I said, Jehoshaphat loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. He really did, heart and soul. But he made these decisions, first giving his son, um, giving, well, taking the wife for his son from this wicked man, this wicked king, probably one of the 
the most wickedest of all the kings of Israel, Ahab, and the Barnon, the wickedest queen, Jezebel. He takes this daughter to be his son. But I felt like the Lord said, as his representatives, we need to evaluate the alliances that we make. So Je Jeho generally cares for his people. He, he goes around, the Bible says that he's from Jerusalem, but he goes around to the different towns, admonishing the people to turn to the Lord and not forsake the Lord. This is what he does. As king, he goes around, he makes his rounds, encouraging people to not fall away from the Lord. Okay? He commissions, um, he sets up a judicial system for the people of Judah so that they can have justice. And he commissions these judges with an expectation to represent the Lord and not to show favoritism. You see what I mean? Like this guy, he's, he's legit. He's a legit king. He really loves the Lord. But he makes poor judgments. And I love this, like I said, I love this about Scripture because we can learn. We can look at other people's decision-making process and we can learn that this guy really loves the Lord, but he makes these, it felt right. You know, it, it feels like everybody does it. It felt right, so I'm going to give my son to this king's daughter. I'm going to go help this guy because basically we bros. But he's this wicked king with a wicked agenda. And he part, it felt right. It looks good, right? But we can see that, is this, that God is watching over Jehoshaphat. Okay, moving on to chapter 20. So now we see a large army coming towards Judah with bad intentions. So in verse 20 it says, After the Moabites and Amorites and some of the Mennonites came, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat, alarm, Jehoshaphat re resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast. I think I have a scripture on that. So when his enemies are moving in on him, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. It's interesting. He didn't panic. He didn't say, um, well, Jehab, uh, Ahab is dead at that point, but he didn't call it, I don't know who's the, who's the king at that point, but he didn't enlist other countries. But this is what he did. He inquired of the Lord and proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came throughout um, together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple and led the people in a prayer of faith. This brought about national revival. This is what he said in verse 12. I don't know if I have this, um, just to let you know, Jody. But um, in chapter 20, if, you, if you're looking, if you're following along in your Bible, chapter 20, verse 12, it says this. He's praying. He's praying to the Lord. This is what his prayer looks like. For we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. He's praying to God. But our eyes are on you. I was telling my wife, I love Jehoshaphat. This guy, he has big faith. He has big faith. He's like, God, these guys are attacking, our enemies are attacking us. We don't know what to do. But he says this, but our eyes are you are on you. Verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and their children, little ones, stood before the Lord. So he's setting this godly example and all the men and their families are following after the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel as he stood in the assembly. He said, so th this is a prophet uh, that God is going to use, well, God is going to use this man to prophesy to the nation of Judah. Okay, so here we see this leader, this king, he's like, God, I don't know what to do. Honestly, these guys, their bad intentions, they're going to attack us. So he prays. Christian, that's what we should do, right? We talk about it. That's what we're going to, here we see Jeho, this is what he's doing. God sends his Holy Spirit to speak through this man. Um, what's his name? Jehaziel, he said this, verse 15 in chapter 20, he said, Listen, King Joseph, and to all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's what the Lord, is, that's what the Lord told his people when they were going into the promised land. That's what the Lord would tell people time and time again. His people, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid or discouraged because the vast army... For the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 16, tomorrow, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeru. You will, not, you will not have to fight this battle. 
But he says this, take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. This is a prophetic word. They see, they're seeking the Lord. God gives them this prophetic word. This word that he gives to his people. This word that he's giving to us. When we're facing things, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Right? So it's interesting. But he says, you have a part in this. He says, you guys need to show up. Right? You guys need to show up. He says, take your, he says go down there. March down against them. Take your positions. You need to show up. You need to stand firm. Right? It says, take your position, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. You're going to watch God deliver you. But you need to have action. You don't just stay home. You don't just do nothing. You have faith. Well, put your faith into action is what he's asking the people. Let's see obedience to your faith. So he goes out. They go out and they stand. And this is what they do. They worship. Now, Jehoshaphat, I love this about, man, Jehoshaphat, big faith. He tells his people, don't be afraid. He has them worshiping the Lord. And then they went. And again, it says Jehoshaphat admonished the people to have faith. So when they're on their way to go, to go and stand, to go and, to go and um, watch the Lord move on his behalf, he tells the people, have faith. He's encouraging them, have faith. I know it looks bad, have faith, right? That's what he's telling them. They worship some more. They pray about it, and they put the worship team in the front. That's what they literally do. Okay, Jerry, go in front of all the army. You know, take the worship members, and you guys, does it sound familiar? It should, because this is the strategy they used, Joshua used, when they defeated Jericho. Put the worshipers out in the front, right? We're going to do it God's way. It doesn't make sense, bro. I know it don't make sense, but that's what God said to do. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to put God first. We're going to, we're going to worship the Lord. You see like where this is going? This is like our, our life. This is our life in a nutshell. What do you do when the enemy comes in like a flood? You seek the Lord. We stand in faith, right? We show up. We stand firm. We watch the deliverance of the Lord. We hear the Lord. We ask God to show us what to do. This is what he's doing, okay? So it says that the fear of the Lord came, came on all the surrounding kingdoms. And then there was peace for, Ju um, for Judah. I love this. It says in verse 32, it says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He reigned for 25 years. But he says this. But it says this in 33. He says, The high places were not removed. So that's where people would go and do their own worship. That they would seek after idols. So he didn't remove. Joseph is a good king and he cannot do everything. But he failed to remove the high places. So the people still had not set their hearts on God of their ancestors. So we see at the end of his reign, he tries to make this alliance with Ahaziah. Ahaziah is a king, is, um, is Ahab's son. I don't know if I have a, I may have, I may have something. So I want to, okay, so King Jehoram, okay, so pretty soon we're getting to that. So he makes an alliance with Ahaz, Ahaziah, sorry. And then the Lord smashed that alliance. It didn't come to fruition. God just smashed it. I don't know why. If it was a lapse in judgment, maybe it's a sense of obligation to connect with Israel. Or if it was misguided op optimism. I don't know what it was, but for some reason, Jehoshaphat, against the Lord's will, always tried to make connection with the wicked. You see that? But God kept on like denying it. So this is what's, what's happening. Okay, so that's in. And then um, Jehoshaphat dies and it says that he rests with his ancestors. But his legacy continues on. And that's what we're talking about a little bit. Yeah, like Jeff, like the legacy that is left. And I know for, we've seen it right this morning when you guys are praying for your daughter, the legacy that is established. So there's a legacy that is established here. I wanted to, I went through all of that to Jehoshaphat's life to show the legacy or the life that he lived. He lived this godly life. And then he, he, he goes, he dies. His son Jehoram succeeds him. This is the one that is married to the daughter of Ahab. Okay? So I wanted to be clear because when I saw this, I was like, oh my goodness. This is something that, that we need to take note of. 
So Jehu rests with his ancestors. His son Jehoram succeeds him. Then it says in chapter 22 of 2 Chronicles, it says, then when, he has the, then when he has the kingdom firmly in his grasp, he has his brothers and officials executed. Okay, so anything that reminds him of the godly, to me, of the godly heritage, he wipes out. He follows the wicked ways of the kings of Israel. Hmm, I wonder where he got that idea from. His wife? I mean, I'm not blaming the wives, okay? I'm not. I'm not blaming the wives. So the wives don't take blame. But what his dad did was he aligned. You see what he did? That one mistake, it felt right. He aligned in the beginning with this wicked king and this daughter of this wicked mom and dad. He did this. So anyway, he follows in the wicked way of the kings. I think it started with, to me, it started with this alliance that he made with Ahab. So we can follow the thread of one decision that felt right that is beginning to now bear fruit, like bad fruit. So at this point, because of what, because of what um, Jehoram is doing, God removes his divine protection from Judah and brought chaos and war. Jehoram did what is evil in the eyes of the Lord and promoted evil and idolatry, the Bible says. Then Elijah wrote him a letter of rebuke warning and warning, but he didn't heed God's warning. Shortly after this, he dies, the Bible says, to no one's regret. So we see that the king's... Oh, thank you. So Jehoshaphat, he dies. Jehoram becomes king, his son, he dies. Then his son, Ahaziah, becomes king of Judah. And at that time, jo Joram who's the son of Ahab, is the king of Israel. Okay. So it's interesting. So now, this is the last chapter I'm cover. Chapter 22. So Ahaziah is now king of Israel. Ahaziah, wait, no. Sorry. Ahaziah is, do I have there? No, no. You, yeah, you had it right. Ahaziah, should I go back to the other one? So Ahaziah, is now king of Judah. So he's two generations down. Ahaziah's grandmother was Jezebel. His mother is Athaliah. And the Bible says this, his mother encouraged him to act wickedly. The Bible says that he did evil in the eye of the Lord, just like his dad, unlike his grandfather. Ahaziah makes alliance with Ahab's son and his uncle Joram. And this would lead to his judgment, um, to his judgment and demise. Now you can go to the next slide. God raises up Jehu, who will eventually be the next king of Israel. He will be, because what he does is he's God's hammer and he wipes out the evil. He brings judgment on Israel and he wipes out the household of Ahab. So he wipes out Joram, and because Ahaziah is there, Ahaziah is wiped out as well. And I thought this was interesting. Verse 10 of chapter 22, it says this, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. You, you, we might just read over that. I felt like that was significant. Why is that significant? Who is she now? She's offspring of Israel, right? Kind of like they were enemies at the time. She's the offspring of a of another country at this time. So the, the kingship or the leadership in Judah is in jeopardy. You guys following? Because it is one bad decision, right? So now Athaliah, or sorry, yeah, Athaliah goes and kills her kids or her, her grandkids, her grandsons who had rightful, um, who, had, who had the right to the throne. But this is what happens. Um, Jehosheba, daughter of Jehoram, her daughter basically took the nephew, Joash, and hid him away from his murderous grandmother. Now, Jehosheba is the wife of Jehoi Jehoida, the priest. Is that confusing? You guys okay? You guys kind of following? You guys following the thread? 
I was hoping that we could follow this thread. Is that a bit too much? Am I going through this a lot too fast? My point is this. Is that the one bad decision took three generations to wipe out. Uh, well, wiped out basically took, took up three generations. It was the third generation that came back, or the fourth generation, however you want to see it, to come back and to instill godliness into the kingdom of Judah. So I'm going to end with this. So basically, Athaliah wipes out the royal family and she just makes herself queen and begins to rule wickedly and destroy the, destroy the, the kingdom of Judah. And then seven years later, Jehoiada, the priest, who is raising Joash, the rightful son to the throne, makes a move and says, you know what, we're going to make him king. So they make him king, and then they, they dispose of Athaliah. And then this brings closure to the season, this dreadful season in Judah. So under the rightful, or the, I guess the worship band can come up again. So under the rightful, or the right heir, the rightful heir to the throne, Joash, under his guidance, and the guidance of Jehoiada, the priest, the people demolish Baal worship and they reinstate worship at the temple and righteousness and order is restored in Judah. And it says this, All the people of the land rejoiced and the city was calm because Athaliah had been slain with the sword. You know, like I said in the beginning, while we cannot go back and redo some decisions we made, we can look at history and we can look at other examples and see like, whoa, even though this godly man loved the Lord and had big faith, he still made these decisions and he, he didn't follow, I guess, he didn't totally follow the Lord, I, I felt. And it led to decisions that took three generations to correct. The Bible says this, and I want to reiterate, Proverbs 16.25, it says this, For there's a way that seems right, but, it, but in the end it leads to destruction. Proverbs 16.25. And I want to close with this. In Matthew 6.33, because I feel like even good in, intending people, like with good intentions, godly people, we still can make poor decisions. And I went through that whole life of Jehoshaphat just to show us like how that one decision in the beginning wreaked havoc. But we can seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all that we need will be added to you. Father, we come to you and God, I know this was, man, this was like a fire hose of information. It was a fire hose of just biblical history and legacy of this man, Jehoshaphat. A man that loved you, a man that had big faith, like a lot of us here, God. We love you and we have faith. Some of us with big faith. I pray that we could take heed and learn from this godly example in the Hebrew Scriptures, God. Can we do this? I, I feel like there's two things. Maybe when, I, when I'm talking about this, we feel like there's a regret. You might like, oh yeah, I did that. Oh, I, I don't know. Sometimes I have that kind of regret and I want to kick myself. So that's one thing. I want to recognize that. And I think there's a process of grieving and we can give it to the Lord and we can ask the Lord. Um, and the second thing is we can ask the Lord that our hearts would respond to His voice. So why don't we, right now, why don't we put our hands out in an act of giving God. God, right now, we put our hands out in an act of faith, giving you something or maybe even a season in life that we might have regret. God, we lift this up to you. We give it to you. We pray that you would take it from us. God, that you'd help us to heal from that. Help us to gain understanding from that. 
And now put your hand on your heart and say, God, I pray that you'd heal my heart, that you'd heal my emotions, that you'd restore unto me a first love, a love, a fire that would burn for you, God. Lord, that, that we would become less, that you'd become more in our lives, that you'd reignite a fire in our hearts, that we would not just hear the truth, that we would not hear your voice, but that we would act on it. God, that you'd give us this fire in our hearts. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.